Good morning. Welcome, ladies. My name is Angie Arvilla. I am the substitute teaching leader here for our uh, Tuesday day class. Uh, so welcome for anyone who is new and for all of you who, are, who I get to see every week. Welcome back. So I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into our lecture this morning. We have no new announcements. Uh, but before we get started, let's uh, go before God in prayer. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for being sovereign. You are holy and we are unworthy. We are unworthy in so many ways. So I thank you for your grace and mercy. And I pray for our lesson today, Lord, that Jehoshaphat may be seen in our lives, Lord, that our prayers may be his prayers and that as we open your word and open your lessons, you show us and teach us and conform us more into your son's precious name. So I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for all that are here. I thank you for all that is seen and unseen, Lord. And we lift all this up to you and we lift up our time. May you guard our words, may you guard my words, and may you guard our hearts um, and reveal to us what you have for us. So we love you, we thank you, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so let's get started. All right, I am a born and raised Texan, which is not as common as you'd think these days. Uh, <laughs> where are you from seems to be a very common question that you ask folks. Um, if you're not a native Texan, that's okay. Welcome to God's promised land. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yes, us Texans, we're a very proud people, right? We love our football. We love our land. Um, and we love that we have an amendment that lets us seek our own security. All right, Angie, where are we going here? What does it mean to feel secure? In a world of constant change, it is obvious that we all seek some measure of security, especially as women. Even as I look around, you may be sitting in the same area that you did last week because we're all creatures of habit. In infancy, a security blanket helps to soothe and calm a crying baby. We install cameras and systems to protect our loved ones, our homes, and our belongings. We even are willing to pay for a just-in-case added protection. And in this all-consuming search, despite our best efforts, we never gain the real security that we seek. Here, we have the story of a king who was godly, and though he sought to secure his kingdom, he lacked the ability in his own strength. He desired it and he needed it, but there is only one way to attain it. True security only comes from seeking God. He is still described as another one of Judah's good kings. So let's take another look at Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. Jehoshaphat. So let's back up. Last week we were in 2 Chronicles. Oh, we're overlapping this week in Jehoshaphat's reign. We're in 2 Chronicles today, 17 through 21. Last week, we were in 1 Kings and the beginning of 2 Kings, where both Ahab and Jeho Jehoshaphat had died. <laughs> we take a deeper dive in 2 Chronicles so they'll be alive again, and we'll really get to see the contrast in their leadership. Yeah, they're raised up. The book of Kings and Chronicles share the same periods of history. They are similar yet different. Kings presents mainly a historical account of the two nations, while Chronicles presents God's view of history and 2 Chronicles focuses on being a book of revival. So let's review. In Israel, we have the northern kingdom, and we have the 10 of the 12 tribes, and so far we've seen Jeroboam, Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri, Omri, and Ahab, seven. They were pretty wicked, so there was a bunch of them, and short reigns, and sadly, they are often forgotten. Judah, in the southern kingdom, we have two of the 12 tribes, and we've seen Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and now we're at Jehoshaphat. Asa brought about the first major reform of removing idols and obedience to God's laws. Jehoshaphat was the second great reformer for reforming period, highlighting the power of prayer and of teaching God's word. We have two divisions for our four chapters today. <laughs> In each division, my prayer is that we'll see how uh, seeking God is the only way to true security and the blessing that spiritual security brings when we seek him. First in chapter 17 and eight, uh, through 19, we'll look at seeking God individually and how we experience his peace. Then in chapters 20 and 21, we'll look at seeking God together and how we experience his grace. 
Jehoshaphat's life was spent seeking God, not perfectly, but consistency, uh, consistently. As we begin in 2 Chronicles 17, Jehoshaphat strengthens his kingdom and seeks God as his father. Asa before him. He wisely placed forces in all the fortified cities, and in verse 3 it says, The Lord was with him because he walked in the earlier ways of his father, seeking God and not Baals. One of BSF's aims is to reach the next generation of younger adults and children with the gospel of Jesus Christ through Bible engagement. This makes me think, what do our children and grandchildren get from us? Are we leaving a legacy for the Lord like these men? What are they learning as they listen and live out the reality of our consequences and our choices? Are we teaching them that seeking God is the only way to true security or do they see God as an insurance policy because we only cry out when we're in trouble? In verse 5, the Lord established the kingdom and all Judah brought tribute. I love how it says his heart was courageous. In just three years of reigning, Jehoshaphat reforms Judah by removing high places and astral poles, but also by sending officials to teach the book of the law of the Lord. God's holy word is powerful. Even today, we do not learn about God and his ways by chance. He speaks to us through the word. By teaching and sharing the word of God, God transforms lives. And we see how he never forsook his people when they sought him. The fear of the Lord fell upon these kingdoms. Even the enemies paid Jehoshaphat tribute. This was such a great honor because tribute was only paid to conquerors like a tax. But to pay tribute out of fear of the Lord was a show of respect. In the Old Testament, material prosperity is evidence of God's blessing. The Philistines and the Arabs bringing their lavish gifts of, are of note because they are long time surrounding enemies, but even their hearts could be changed. God lovingly gave his people rest on all sides. In verses 12 through 19, his kingdom grows more powerful and has fortified them with supplies and soldiers. They are secure for about 17 years. As I stepped into my leadership role, I understood the statement, heavy lies the crown. <laughs> I by no means am comparing myself to one of these kings or the responsibilities they had, but as I navigated these new responsibilities, I could feel the spiritual warfare, warfare coming on heavy. I'm just going to call it what it was. The enemy did not want me to continue God's work. He did not want me in God's word. He wanted me distracted. He didn't want me preparing lessons and trainings for classes and leaders. He wanted me failing and fighting with lo my loved ones. Anything that could come up did. A virus ran through our house. It wasn't COVID, it wasn't the flu, it wasn't strep. Even though I've got a ton of petri dishes at home, um, no idea what it was, but it lingered for a week. My husband had to let go of a dishonest employee, which demanded more of our time. The kids' school approached me of needing someone to lead and organize the a festival fundraiser, it was a lot, all at the same time. And I could have said no, but as we walk in obedience to God's will, opposition finds us. It's not a matter of if it will, but when it does. Who do we seek? I felt like Elijah, physically weary and ill, doubting if this was the right decision, fearful I had put my family in the path of the enemy, but I am reminded of God's love and protection in these lessons. The, battle we face, the battles we face are momentary, while the resilience we gain is everlasting. I saw how fortifying and seeking the Lord for strength during times of quiet and rest are so important for what lies ahead. So when a storm finds me again, I'm quicker to go to God. Our tests can be testimonies if we just submit. I call chapter 18 the compromising chapter because that's what it felt like. Jehoshaphat had a heart for his people. I got the sense he was sad that the kingdom was divided, that he really felt they were all the same when he says, I am as you are, my people, as your people, we will be with you in war. He had God's favor. He had honor and riches. So why go to Ramoth Gilead to help Ahab? Unity is important, but not at the cost of compromise. Jehoshaphat compromised himself and his people. With a matrimonial alliance, he gave his son Jehoram 
in marriage to the, to, to the daughter of King Ahab and Jezebel named Athaliah, which we'll find in the next coming weeks what she does. Two of the most ungodly and wicked people in the Bible to be tied to. It would be like President Bush giving one of his lovely daughters in marriage to Saddam Hussein's son. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> I think it's funny you guys like that analogy. <laughs> okay. Okay, God is good. <laughs> and then in verse 4, he adds, First seek the counsel of the Lord. Even with his unwise alliance, he, is, he still was seeking God for direction for his decisions. After 400 false prophets, Micaiah enters the scene and speaks truth. Go home. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Ahab, in his disdain for Micaiah, throws him into a further fit. But what does Jehoshaphat do? He ignores these warnings and puts out of fear and, and, yeah, and out of fear for man, doesn't reject Ahab and go home in peace, but agrees to go to battle. Can you relate? Have you chosen your way instead of seeking God's way and forfeiting peace for a fight? How can being bold and saying no guard our hearts, time, and devotion? I'll be the first one to tell you I have a hard time saying no as we've seen. But it's not out of fear of man or rejection. It's because I struggle to prioritize what the Lord has entrusted me with. God is and should be my first priority, myself and my relationship with him. Then my husband, then my children and family, then to my faith family, which includes church, BSF, wherever God's called, and then finally to the lost world. It's easy to say no when you put a value on it. God, who is our source of true security, responds to our cries. When Jehoshaphat seeks him alone for deliverance, it's immediate. Verse 29, Ahab enters the battle in disguise, and he convinces Jehoshaphat to go in his royal robes. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought he was Ahab, so they turned. Ready to attack, and Jehoshaphat was immediately aware he had only one hope. The Lord God Almighty. Jehoshaphat cried out, and God delivered him. He was seeking God alone for the deliverance. He desperately needed no rebuke, no I told you so's, just immediate mercy and grace. Mercy is not receiving the punishment we do deserve, while grace is a freely given gift we don't deserve. God drew them away, causing them to realize he wasn't Ahab, and they simply stopped pursuing him. And meanwhile, Ahab dies by a random arrow. Okay. Has God not responded once to these men's cries, prayers, or pleas? Never, not once. Every chapter we've studied so far does not come up empty. God delivers, God saves, and God preserves those who seek him. Jehoshaphat was delivered because in his moment of need, he sought God alone. Those who seek God experience his peace. This gives us our first principle. Those who seek God experience his peace. Those who seek God experience his peace. Jehoshaphat thought, though imperfect, still received the peace that comes from true security because he was seeking God in his devotion and the direction of his decisions. God had words for him. Though we will never be put to shame when we call in the name of the Lord, God did not miss an opportunity to get his child back on the straight and narrow. As chapter 19 opens, Jehoshaphat returns safely to Jerusalem and God sends the seer Jehu, the prophet, to admonish him. Verse 2 says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. But verse 3, nevertheless, there is some good in you. For you have rid the land of Asherpoles and have set your heart on seeking God. God is the only way, is the only one who truly knows our heartbeat. Sometimes he blesses us despite our shortcomings. This ignited Jehoshaphat. His name means God judges, and that is exactly what he was determined to do. He went out appointing judges in all the major cities and trusting them to judge not for man, but for God. No, just, no injustice, partiality, or bribery. He gave these men many instructions and heavy responsibilities. In verse 11, it says, he finishes saying, act with courage, and may the Lord be with those who do well. Jehoshaphat's trial with Ahab helped him understand the importance of truly seeking God. 
turning the hearts of his people back to the Lord was the preparation they needed to face what was coming ahead. We'll see as we get into chapter 20 that Jehoshaphat gets the news that a vast army is coming, uh, coming soon to attack them, and God has, has them ready to respond in the best way possible. They're going to seek him together. Jehoshaphat is ready to do the right thing this time, but that doesn't mean he wasn't afraid. Why was he afraid? Let's look at it together. In your lesson books, if you turn to page one, there's a nice little map. And this helped me a lot. Uh, this first page helped me understand the geography of his situation. Judah in, is in the pinkish here on the bottom. He's the southern, this is the southern kingdom. Um, so this is Judah, to the left of the Dead Sea. As you can see, Edom is on the bottom. We've got Moab and Ammon to the right of Israel. Judah is surrounded on all borders. So he did have cause to fear. If you look at this map, he is completely surrounded on all sides. So I hope that helped you. It did help me a little bit. He had reason to be afraid for his people. And what does he do? He proclaims a fast throughout, king, throughout his kingdom, having them assemble to seek help from the Lord. And he stands before the assembly and he prays. This gives us this week's doctrine. Every week we have a doctrine, and this one's prayer. Prayer is talking to God. He delights in our prayer because he delights in spending time with his children. Whether we pray amid a crisis or it's a joyful no noise, nothing surprises our all-knowing Father. Prayer prepares our heart to communicate with him. It involves all persons of the Trinity. We pray to God our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is only on the basis of his atonement that we come in and through the Holy Spirit. Does this mean we always get what we want in prayer? Like any good parent, God's answer may be no, or not yet. But as we've seen with Judges Kings, nevertheless, God's desire is for us to come to him in prayer concerning all things. Christ's costly sacrifice opened the door for sinful man to be able to come before the throne of a holy God with our cares and concerns. Those who exercise prayer See how powerful of a tool it can be. We all need prayer. Why? Jehos just like Jehoshaphat, we all face situations in which we are powerless. But God, being all-powerful and sovereign, gives his children exactly what we need to accomplish his will. How do you view prayer? Is it a part of your everyday life? Practicing prayer, praying for one another, and asking for prayers from others helps us to make this more of an everyday reality. Satan tempts us to think we are bothersome or that our concerns are insignificant, but that is a lie. Prayer is a blessing that brings us into communion with God, and it brings us into communion with others. When we desire prayer, we see, we get to see God clearly. We see his infinite care, his immeasurable power, and constant presence. Let's read Jehoshaphat's amazing prayer together in verse 6. O oh Lord, God of our Father, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in the house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Sur, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us coming to give us out of, the, out of your possession, which you gave, given us an inherit, to inherit, O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against you, this great horde coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a perfect picture of prayer. He acknowledges who God is, what he's done. He confesses their need, and he specifically asks for judgment. No matter the outcome of what Jehoshaphat's, what's in Jehoshaphat's heart, it comes out in his mouth for the whole nation to witness and await in faith. They await in faith by laying, uh, laying 
laying the prayer before God and letting it go. The people's response was immediate, and God's response was immediate. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jehaziel, and he gives specific instructions to a specific prayer. Tomorrow, go. They will come up from Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge. No need to fight, but stand firm. Hold your positions and see the salvation of the Lord. Do not be afraid or dismayed. Tomorrow, go, and the Lord will be with you. The people of Judah immediately followed in faith by praising and worshiping. Have you experienced this type of life-changing prayer? Do we await the response we are looking for and totally miss how, he's provi- how God's provided and protected? His ways are not our ways, and praise Jesus for that. Because the creator of all who knows the beginning and the end of our story graciously gives. He is good, and all he does is good. Do we believe that? Jehoshaphat further encourages his people the next day to walk in faith by sending men ahead of the group to sing and praise. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. What a battle song. How many times does the right worship song come on at just the right time that moves our spirit and speaks to us directly? We are all but children of God yearning to hear the sweet rhythms and rhymes of our Heavenly Father's voice. As they sing, God sees. As they praise, God protects. As they await, the enemies receive their fate. And as they depend, God delivers them. I'm preaching to the choir here when I say it isn't always about being right or winning. (laughs) What does that do but isolate and elevate ourselves? Being courageous doesn't always mean fighting. But as we see, defending and standing firm is the path God chose for them. He was glorified in their obedience instead of their resistance. Verse 27, they enter Jerusalem rejoicing and head straight to the temple to celebrate and worship over their victory. When the nations around them heard how the Lord fought for them, the fear of his power and protection fell on them. Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace because God had given them rest. Much like the gospel, we can witness all day long, but what shines is our walk. God's mighty power is what moves mountains and transforms lives. Though some will reject God and his gospel, they can still uh, feel, they can still fall in fear and respect, just like these neighboring nations. Jehoshaphat led them to seek God as a nation. He unified them by putting God first. Judah was reminded of God's power, God's promises, and his presence with them. Those who seek God experience his grace. This gives us our second principle. Those who seek God experience his grace. They sought him together, but even individually we can experience God's grace. Who has God placed in your life to help you stand firm and seek him? How can reaching out together help sustain and equip you? God's grace abounds when we come together, love one another, pray for each other, and fellowship together. BSF is one of the best ways to grow in community with lovers of Christ. Sometimes it is easier to be honest amongst the ladies in your circle than it is to a close friend or family member. I'm sure you have found by now, the more you share, the more in common you are, because we all face situations that have us saying, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Fellowship leads to relationship. Warning. As we summarize Jehoshaphat's life, there is another application to point out. He reigned for 25 years, and like the kings before him, he made another detour toward the end of his his days. I'm not sure if it's weariness or pride from all the honors and spoils, or if their memory fades of all the goodness God has done and delivered them from. Nonetheless, although he makes another alliance with his son-in-law, uh, Haiza to build a fleet of ships, God lovingly disciplines him by destroying the ships. Do we see how God ultimately guarded him from intermingling with someone who would, would cause him to compromise yet again? We see that when we seek God, we experience peace and grace, but that when we put our hope and faith in Jesus Christ, it is God who seeks us. He guides, directs, and sometimes disciplines us back to him. That is the true security we seek. A faithful father who will never leave us, 
Seeking God is the only way to have true security and to experience his peace and his grace. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for Jehoshaphat's prayer. Thank you for giving us such a godly example of recognizing who you are, who we are, our need for you, and giving us this special gift of coming before you in all things. You are good and righteous. You show us the way. You get us back on the way when we have strayed. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the heart of each lady here today, Lord, that they may hear, um, hear what your lessons were today. That true security comes from seeking you. That all else that we seek comes up empty. That you are the provider, the protector, and the preserver of our life. So I thank you, Lord, for this time that we got to spend. I thank you for this lesson. And I thank you, Lord, for being a God that is all-powerful and all-knowing and giving us exactly what we need. So as we go forth today, I lift up each lady that we may be the light, be the witness, be the gospel to this lost and broken world. And I thank you for this opportunity to come before you yet again in prayer. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.